Friends, welcome to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the week of November 9th. John Eldridge in the studio with Alan Arnold. Uh, And Alan is often in the studio with us because he's producer and often co-hosting this. But Alan is in the studio this week for a very special reason I want to tell you about in just a moment. But I just need to acknowledge we are recording this November 9th uh, podcast prior to the November 3rd election and all that's going to roll out from it. And the timing of what we're about to talk about we think is very appropriate to the week of November 9th. But we also just need to acknowledge, friends, you know, that this isn't late breaking news. Um, we're, you know, we're not recording this the evening of of November 8th. So we want to talk about chaos. We want to talk about operating in a world of chaos and a new book that Alan has just released on that. But before we go there, uh, another quick announcement. Jesus moved us several months ago to begin a twice a month or every other week is kind of how it works out, Zoom uh, roundtable for all of our guys out there that have been leading or are wanting to lead men through the Wild at Heart message. It's called the Wild at Heart Local Leaders Zoom call, roundtable, confab, hangout. And it's been chugging along. We've been trying to get it going. It's really beautiful to connect with men from all around the world, connect with our team. And the first foray of this is is into the men's world. We're not going to leave the ladies out, but we're just kind of testing how all this can work in the new world. So, guys, if you're interested in being a part of that, I'd love to have you join us. There's actually one this week on Thursday, which would be November 12th. And it's in kind of midday in the U.S. So we can pick up early morning in Australia and the East and we can pick up late evening in, in Europe and in the British Isles. You can find it at wildatheart.org is our website slash leaders. And that will get you there. But Alan, the world, the chaos, the upheaval, the uncertainty... And then here you come with a brand new book entitled Chaos Can't Overcome What Comes Against You in This Shaken World. We have to talk about this. Some of our listeners will remember, Alan, that your first book came out a couple years ago. In 2016. Yeah, The Story of With. Yes. Which was uh, almost like a Pilgrim's Progress sort of allegorical Mm -hmm. narrative about trying to live life with God right? as opposed to living life without God. Right. Even though we know a lot about God, we can easily live without him if we're not careful. Yep. Yep. It feels like that's our default. Mm -hmm. It's the conscious choice to live with God. Anyway, marvelous book. Many of you have written Alan and told him how much you loved it. And and then... uh, Suddenly, here at the end of 2020, in, in what's a pretty wild story we want to tell, Alan, you have, you have a new book out called Chaos Can't. Yes. Did you know that this was coming? I had no idea how fast it was coming. It really came out of a personal journey of I was writing a book, and it had been four years since my last book came out, but had no idea exactly what shape it was taking. It was just about how chaos erodes so much of our hopes and dreams. And so I started it, John, as an allegory, like the story of with, wrote the whole book, had editorial comments, rewrote the whole book as an allegory again. And then just three months ago, God really shook my world by saying, no, no, no. For times like this, we don't need an allegory. People are going under Life is traumatic, and so the book needs to be a teaching book, and it needs to be out now. And I said, okay, God, I I got it. I'll start that. And he was like, no, 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 now, now. (laughs) And that started a process where in about 10 weeks, the book went from zero to finished. 10 weeks. Holy cow. 
And it's a very kindly written book, I want to say, that the flow of it, the structure of it, the, even the, the length of the chapters, if you want to call them that, are incredibly brief. Why did you write it this way? Yeah, I, I wrote it in a way because I, my sense was we are all under so much chaos in our lives. Our, our days are not like they used to be, and people, I think, are in states of trauma more than they realize. And so I wanted bite-sized chapters that would be just enough to get them to the next step in the journey. So like a page or two, not 20 pages. And each chapter to me was like one more step on a journey that was a hopeful and a defiant journey of you don't have to live with chaos, mm. but let's take it a step at a time. You don't have to, to take months to read this book, but you can just take a few pages at your own pace. Yeah, it's so good. It's so kind. And there still is some allegory in it mm -hmm. and, and lots of good storytelling, lots of good analogies. But you give a definition of chaos that I'd love for you to read for us. Yeah. I thought it was important in the beginning of the book to define what do I mean by chaos? Because, you know, there's a lot of different ways people have defined that. And dictionary.com defines it as a state of utter confusion or disorder. So when I first looked up chaos, I thought, you know, that's, that's true. And it's a little like saying an earthquake is disruptive. You go, right, but it's a lot more than that. And it's, it's much more personal, at, right. at least in the direction that you're writing. Oh, it's a, I think it's so much more personal. So I created a definition to kind of anchor the reader into what I'm talking about. And here's how I define chaos. Chaos is a destructive, fear-based force that prevents you from fully living. The ways it comes against you, large and small, are often intensely personal strikes meant to leave you empty. Mm. And John, I, I think that's a big distinction because things like the pandemic or things like a natural disaster can feel big and they are big and generic in that they affect people in many cases kind of the same way, but there's something more at play even in those situations. And that is chaos, I think, comes against us in ways that feel uniquely crafted to take us out. Doesn't it? And that's what started me really on the journey of this book is what's going on here because I know what it's like when I feel chaotic but what is chaos outside of me? Because it feels like something is coming against me in mm. ways that's different from how it comes against you and the listeners. And in each case, it is meant to shut us down, to destroy our dreams, to put us on the sidelines. So what's going on there? That yeah. started the journey. Yeah, that's good. I want you to read what you've got these little, these short little two-page like summary of, of things, these steps. I want you to read the first thing chaos wants. Yeah, so the first thing chaos wants, the, I'm just going to read a page or two from the book. It wants in. Whatever the storm is, it begins outside of you, but it doesn't want to stay outside. It's looking to get in, into your head and into your heart. Notice this. The fact that it wants in means it can't get in without your permission. Someone can knock on your front door, but you choose whether to let him into your home. You'd never let a stranger in if you sensed they wanted to do harm. Yet we do that all the time with chaos. We let it in. Consider the disciple Peter when he was in the boat with Jesus. He desperately wanted to walk on water. He initiated the process, but then he shifted his gaze from Jesus before him to the chaos below him. Once Peter let chaos in, he started to sink. In Matthew 14, 31, we read, Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand. Then he said, faint heart, what got into you? Did you catch what Jesus asked? What got into you? In other words, it wasn't Peter, but the fear he let in. In so many things in our lives, it's not us, but what we let in. Something happens at work or with your finances. Perhaps it's a health issue or a crisis with one of your children. Maybe you're dealing with all these categories simultaneously. These are the external issues swirling around you but they remain outside of you unless or until you let them in. How does it look to let chaos in? It usually begins with unhelpful self-talk. We entertain thoughts like, 
how much can one person handle? Or why is it up to me to solve everyone else's problems? Or nothing is going to ever change. The world is a scary place. There's never enough time or there's never enough money or one that I struggle with a lot. I'm all on my own. Perhaps for you, it's life isn't fair. I always get the raw end of the deal. This type of internal monologue never leads anywhere helpful. It weakens your resolve as you start to believe a false interpretation of what's going on. If you embrace these fear-based thoughts, it will change you and not for the better. Your thoughts are the door that chaos will use to enter your heart and mind. The longer you stay in this mindset, the wider you open the door. You write as a man familiar with chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, John, really, this book was like a therapy session for me as I was writing it. And I think the, the best books tend to be when we capture the journey we're on, not just a topic that we want to research, but the journey that we're living through. And I found myself not doing well with chaos. And so the more chaotic things got in the world, I found the more I was letting it into me. And I didn't like the man I was becoming. And my wife, Kelly, you know, lovingly has told me, Alan, when things are calm, you are really good. Like around our home, with our children, if things are going well, you are like the most awesome leader. But when things get chaotic, and by chaotic, it could just be there's four or five things that are needed at this moment simultaneously. Maybe not even crisis. Right. Not, maybe not even crisis. Maybe it's simply the fact that the car has a flat tire and someone needs a ride somewhere that wasn't planned. And I just found out about a bill that hadn't been paid. And a couple of things like that. Not the end of the world. Not a huge medical diagnosis. Just life. But when those things would all come at once in a way that felt uniquely designed to take me out, I would take the bait every time and I would become more chaotic. And that was her comment. Like when things get chaotic, you don't calm things down. You actually become even more chaotic and more damage is done from your responses in terms of relationships <laughs> and in terms of just the heart than, than the actual issues. And that... <sighs> It was hard to hear, but I knew she was right. God bless the loving words <laughs> of our spouses, our friends, yes, our colleagues. God bless Kelly for being willing to say, you know, Alan, when things get chaotic, you kind of get chaotic. And that got you started on a journey. Right. A journey to find out. What's going on? Because if chaos is uniquely coming against us, how is that possible? And, and why haven't I heard more about that? And, and what does it look like? Because if I can understand what's really going on, I can start to move toward the cure. Yes. And without that, I'm just in this endless cycle yes. of getting spun up. Yes. And the world and the enemy has endless ways to do that. It seems like his main goal is to get us spun up. Right. 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 And then and the beautiful thing about the timing of God, like right after the election, are you kidding me? This book comes out. Well, actually it came out right before the election, but the timing of this right, right now for the world and even God urging you, it was like releasing the pause app. You know, he just mm -hmm. prompted our team to get this thing done. And we're like, yeah, okay. We've never built an app. That's, you know, sure. Okay. We'll do it. You know, and we released the app in the spring. And then yes. the first round of quarantine and pandemic and all that hits. And that app has been a lifeline for a lot of people. It really has. And I think a lot of times God will prepare us for something. You know, you've talked in past podcasts about how when you're going through hard times, often it's preparing us for something that's yet to come. And we need to be the man or woman yes. in that time. So we're in an initiation or preparation mode. And I felt like with this book, God gave me a window to really put something together while everyone around me seemed to be shutting down and I had been shutting down. 
And it felt like God's mercy to say, I'm going to give you something that will ultimately allow hope to come back into what has been a really shaken world. And that's what I hope this book will do for listeners is it's not really a book all about chaos. It's about the hope of overcoming chaos and the way to do that. And so chaos is the problem, but the focus is on what God's up to in the midst of it. What's that invitation? That is such a beautiful reframing of it, which is what we want to bring our listeners today. And we also want to encourage folks. The title of the book is Chaos Can't, and it's on Amazon right, right. now. It's on Amazon as a physical book, a paperback book, and an ebook for people that want that. Okay. So there's more answers than we're going to be able to give in today, but we do want to give some direction for for today. And to go back into the story, Alan, you were talking to the team yesterday about Genesis chapter one Mm -hmm. and verse two, which has a really fascinating Hebrew phrase, tahu wabahu, right? Yes. Formless and void. The spirit of God was hovering over the formless and void, right? right? All, all was welter and waste was, uh, was one translation yes. of it, right? Yes. And that God himself has the ability to enter into what looks chaotic, what may very well be chaotic, right? and begin to bring order and beauty mm-hmm. and life to it. Right. Is that kind of one of your main sort of themes? We can do that too? It is. And I'm so like, you're going to find me kind of geeking out on this because this is a topic that for years I've researched and I love. And and the reason why is, John, it's the very first lesson that God as our Father teaches us in Scripture. So we're all familiar with Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then kind of we skip in our thought process to Genesis 1-3, which is the first day of creation, the beginning of creation. Yes, light and dark. Right. And, yeah. and we're familiar with that, but we don't really know what to do with Genesis 1-2. So it feels like this kind of strange, mysterious verse we just skim over. But what's happening there, Hebrew scholars say, whatever else is going on, God is through his spirit brooding or hovering over the murky darkness, this inky blackness, this substance of chaos. And what's happening in that moment is the chaos is being transformed into beauty and life and order. And actually, the brilliance of all of creation is about to happen, and it's not happening once the chaos goes away. God's not waiting on chaos Mm -hmm. to leave. He's entering into the chaos, and he's transforming it. And it's the very first thing he teaches us to do. And, and so that intrigued me so much because I'm thinking if, if that's the first lesson God gives us, his first identity we see in Scripture is as creator. And the very first thing he's doing as creator is transforming or moving against chaos to make something beautiful out of it. And so if he's showing us that, I believe the purpose is so we'll do that. If he's giving us that lesson, he's saying, and now as I do, Mm. you can do. Okay, that's fascinating because I'm one of those people that didn't know really what to do with that verse. You know, you you sense the, you know, the hovering over the the waters. There's some actually some very maternal language there. Right. There's a caring, loving You know, Jesus says to Jerusalem, I'd love to take you under my wings, that kind of hovering over, that brooding over. But the idea that God wants to show us something, dear sons and daughters, you too are going to have this commission on your life. You are going to need to enter into darkness or the unknown or that which feels fearful or confusing, or frustrating, or exasperating, or, you know, and enter into it in order to bring life. Exactly. And it's even more beautiful because that picture of what the Spirit is doing there in the empty void places before creation begins, then we later see 
in the New Testament how the Holy Spirit comes into the empty void places in us and does the exact same thing in our hearts. The empty void places are replaced with Mm. life and beauty Mm. and hope and the fruits of the Spirit. And so we see it in creation and we see it in our own hearts. And so when people today are saying, man, I I just feel empty. I just feel like there's nothing there. I have nothing. I'm void. They're in essence using this language of Genesis 1-2 and they're speaking of the need and they're also revealing that, yes, there's an antidote. Just like in Genesis 1-2, the spirit will come and renew and restore and refresh those empty void places. Oh gosh, I want to pray (laughs) and just say right now, Holy Spirit, fill our empty places. Come into our personal chaos because we need it. And the timing of this is so kind as well because people are facing greater levels of chaos and hardship. And the book, again, is very, very kind, kind of like your voice. It's very soothing very kind and you you take the reader through simple progressions. I want to jump to the little section called First Learn Stand, Then Learn Fly, which is a quote from the, the movie Karate Kid. Could you read read a little bit of that for us? Yeah, absolutely. In the 1984 movie, The Karate Kid, there's a famous scene where Mr. Miyagi is teaching his impatient student, Daniel, an essential truth. First learn stand, then learn fly. Nature's rule, Daniel San, not mine. There's a progression to what we're learning here. First is standing, which is not letting chaos in. I'll address the learning to fly part soon, but we must master the first before considering the second. So how do we not let chaos in? These five practices are a good start. One, stop allowing chaos to surprise you. Remember, Jesus said, in this world, we'll have trouble. But because he has overcome it, we can take heart and have peace. John 16, 33. So the first step is to be aware and have a game plan for what you'll do when it hits. This alone moves you from playing defense to offense. Two, reject the lie. Acknowledge that a situation or person is chaotic and trying to make you fearful. But remember that giving in to chaos and fear is your choice. Chaos cannot invade your domain, your heart, and your head without your permission. It wants you to believe you have no choice but to become chaotic when chaos hits. That's a lie. Remember the truth. Jesus has already overcome the whole world. Three, guard your heart. When we turn to God, he gives us a new heart. In Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20, we read, I will give you one heart and a new spirit. I will take from you your hearts of stone and give you tender hearts of love for God so that you can obey my laws and be my people and I will be your God. You have a new heart. Now the goal is to protect it from all that wants to come against it. Scripture puts it this way, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Proverbs 4.23 Your heart is what the enemy is most after. And he will throw as much chaos at you as possible to cause you to lose heart or give it to the wrong things. That is why we must guard it. Four, fill your hearts with what's good. This isn't something to begin doing when chaos strikes. It's something to pursue daily, not reactively, but proactively. God offers to fill our hearts with things that bring us life. But again, we choose what goes in. If we choose to let chaos in, we become empty and void. If we fill ourselves with what God offers, we brim with life. If you find yourself responding to the storms of life in ways that aren't helpful, perhaps it's because you're filling yourself with the wrong substance. So what should we fill our hearts with? In Deuteronomy 6, 5-7, through we're told, Love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love Him with all that's in you. Love Him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you, and then get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. 
it gets even better because the Holy Spirit actually resides in the hearts of all who love God. The perimeter of our hearts is defended by the Spirit. The fruit or attributes of the Holy Spirit provide us with nine layers of protection against the chaos trying to get in. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The Spirit infuses us with these internal gifts to help us keep fear, doubt, and all the rotten fruits of chaos out. If you feel chaos keeps finding a way in, ask the Holy Spirit for help. Perhaps you like peace or kindness. Maybe you could use an infusion of self-control or patience. Rather than continue to try to fight outside rage with inner rage, watch what happens when you counter it with gentleness. Five. Let what's in flow out. When our hearts are filled with the fruit of the Spirit, there won't be room for chaos to come in. Then we can respond to what comes against us by drawing upon the good within us. This way of living is transformative, and it's how we will eventually learn to fly. These five steps are our first line of defense in this shaken world. And we had to start there because... Folks need to put up some barricades. I mean, right now, it's just stop the rampage of chaos and all its fruits through our souls. Lock the doors, right? right? Stop the terrorists from just rampaging through our lives. Totally. Yes. Yes. Standing against it, guarding our hearts, rejecting it. In order that, and that's just, that's early in the book. You're just trying to get people on kind of solid ground. It's but, orientation. Yeah. But yeah. The, the goal of the book and where the book makes a major shift is, okay, now here's how to move into chaos in order to bring order and beauty and life. Tell me about your journey into that. Right. Well, I realized not letting chaos in is a great first step. As you said, it, it it allows me to just be able to interpret what's really going on. And John, the book goes into like where chaos began. And I think we won't go into that right now, but I think that will astonish some listeners because I don't believe chaos entered our world during the fall with Adam and Eve because the serpent was already a being of chaos at that moment. So it takes readers back into where did chaos really begin? And once we know that and how that enemy wields that like this weapon against us, then what are we to do? And I believe from that Genesis 1-2 invitation, God is saying, I'm giving you a role to play alongside me to counter the chaos. And each of us can do that in our domain, our area of influence. So what I quickly realized is that doesn't mean if there's some chaotic event or riot, I'm not saying pick up a a flower and charge into it and think you're going to change what's going on in that moment, because that's probably not your area of authority or your domain. But what I started to see is in our own realm of influence and authority, our home, with our family, with our job in our church, in our neighborhood, we do have a realm of authority where we can actually change the atmosphere for good. And so in the book, in the latter part, I kind of uh, riff off of, in The Mask of Zorro, there's this famous scene called The Master's Will, where the older Zorro, Anthony Hopkins, the actor, takes the younger Zorro into training. And he does so basically saying, you have something that you want to defeat, but you would have fought bravely and died quickly without the training. And so I feel like in kindness to the reader, I want to take them into training of how do we, once we stop letting the chaos within us, now how do we change the world around us? And it's one of the best approaches. If we don't like the chaos we see, if, if we are feeling overwhelmed by it, now we don't just have to lock our doors and hunker down and try to wait it out. 
we can actually be an agent of change for good as we go alongside God. So in the book, there's these 11 levels of a circle that starts at the center and goes outward with the hope that by the time you're at that 11th level, and each of these is just like a page or two, you know, it's not, the levels are not super complex, but it helps us go, now I'm a different person because I can't change the world around me until God has changed me. Mm. So what does that look like so that when I'm now walking into situations at home, situations with my teenager at the office, uh, in traffic, you know, at the coffee shop or in our neighborhood, how do I bring beauty, life, and order from the chaos that's swirling around me? So that's my hope. And I love the transition in the book that you make to that. The The title of the new section is Unshaken Overcomers, right? First, we will not be shaken. Right. And I had recommended a couple of weeks ago when Stace and I were in the studio that uh, great Brian Johnson Bethel song, We Will Not Be Shaken. Love that song. A couple albums old, but we're playing it in our house lately, like We Will Not Be Shaken. But then... You talk about bringing our creativity, our hearts, our gifting, our love into the world around us. And I don't know that I've even shared this with you, Alan. I've been spending a lot of time with Jesus through 2020, asking him, what is going on in the world? How do we interpret this? How do we live well? How do the friends of God operate? Yes. And... We ended the podcast last week praying together, thy kingdom come. I think that there is an element of enforcing the kingdom of Jesus back to Adam and Eve, right? Right. Rule and subdue. Rule in the midst of chaos. Chaos doesn't have to win. Chaos doesn't get to win. But there's a ruling element to it. It's not just asking God to change things. We do ask, we pray, please, Lord, I need your help with this. I need a job. I need you to come from my health. I need you to come from my son. Like, of course, of course we ask. But there is an element to the mature believer that we rule and reign alongside of God. We partner with him into it. And that idea, anyway, What I hadn't shared with you was Jesus said, in the coming chaos, those who are aligned with me will rule. Those who are aligned with me will rule. And so the first part of the book, you're helping everybody kind of let's all get aligned. Right. Let's bring our hearts back into alignment with Jesus in some beautiful ways, including the power of love. And then the second part sort of swings into those who are aligned with me will rule. They will lead. Leadership is going to be needed in the world. And I think it's going to be provided by the mature friends of Jesus. And so he had been saying some of these things to me privately. And then here you come out with this book in 10 weeks, (laughs) a 10 week chaotic period of creation it was practically like Genesis 1. <laughs> it was that kind of, wait, what? 10 weeks in yeah. what? Yeah. But, John, what you're naming, I totally align with because God is inviting us to participate with him in the transforming of the world around us and in the people around us. And the enemy knows if he can cut us at the knees with chaos, he will. If chaos causes us to give up or postpone what we had dreams of doing or just shutting down or worse, becoming more chaotic, like the worst thing we can do is become, if we respond to chaos by trying to out chaos, chaos, we never win because we're, we're becoming the thing we don't want. And now the enemies brought us into that. And so... I believe God gives us this unique invitation of, I'm not just going to take the chaos away. I'm going to invite you as sons and daughters with me 
to make that happen. Part of God's response to chaos, I say in the book, is us. Yes. Like, yes, he could just snap his fingers and everything would, all the chaos would be gone. He could, but we wouldn't be initiated in that process. We wouldn't learn intimacy within the storms of life by that happening. And so I think it's a a beautifully honoring thing he says is come with me, follow me, yes, yes. and let's do this together. And I love it that you put that at the center of the wheel, you know, so to speak, the analogy of the of the training wheel. The center of the wheel is with. Yes. With God, right? Echoing your first book, like we absolutely have to listen, partner with, and listen in the details. God, what are you up to? How do you want me to respond? And you tell some honest stories of messing it up with your family, but then also some really beautiful stories of engaging your teenage children in in ways that were really redemptive, short, hopeful moments of, okay, God, I'm going to do this with you this time. I'm not going to freak out. Right. We can do this together. And if we don't, John, if, if we don't get caught off guard by chaos, like to to wake up each day, and I've done this so much in my life, expecting the day will go easy and well. And when chaos hits, I'm stunned. Like it's like, what? What? Wait. And I'm immediately caught off guard and playing defense. Mm. And that's never the best way to approach chaos. Mm. And so it's not an agreement to say, I'm not saying we should all believe every moment of our day will have chaos. But what I am saying is we shouldn't be surprised by chaos any more than we're surprised when there's a storm or a weather change. Like, it is part of life. Or new quarantines, new restrictions, new political systems, seizing control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a chaotic hour, and we are the sons and daughters of God. And it's a very encouraging thought that God chose each of us to live in 2020 right, and in 2021. This is our moment. Yes. This is our hour. And so thank you for the offering of this book. Thank you for giving guidance to our friends. Chaos Can't by Alan Arnold, Overcome What Comes Against You in This Shaken World, available now on Amazon. Let's pray together as we close. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. First, I ask you to fill the void within me. Breathe your life, your order, your beauty within me by the presence of a living God within me. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I speak order into my own soul. I speak order into my own mind. I command the swirling chaos to cease, just as Christ commanded the storm to cease. And I align with you. I I literally command that my being and my life come into alignment with yours. I bind my mind to the mind of Christ. I bind my heart to the heart of Christ. I choose union. I choose oneness, and I am insisting in prayer that only Christ may affect me, may dwell within me. Only our union may dwell within me, and not chaos or fear or anger or anything else, not revenge. Lord, only you and only your love. And then together, Lord, we are speaking order into our worlds, homes, families, relationships, work, health, all of it. Into our communities, we are speaking the order of God. Come, kingdom of God. Come, reign of Jesus Christ. Show us, Jesus how to reign in this hour, first internally, 
And then externally, show us how to partner with you into the chaos of the moment, wherever we are, to bring life and beauty and the kingdom of God. We continue to invoke the supremacy of the rule of Jesus Christ into our lives and our realms and into the world in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.